just to, uh, to uh, get us back up to speed, uh, as we solve these uh, dynamics problems, especially in terms of the kinetics that we're working with now. Remember that the, we start with the kinematics, which is just where things are, how fast they're moving, what's the acceleration at certain times. And then the kinetics is how do we how do we get those accelerations, how do we get those velocities, etc. And we have three three ways now that we solve these problems. The first uh, using F equals M A works very good for general problems, works great for constant force constant mass and this constant acceleration problems. Um, general problems, uh, those that either need or have the acceleration in them, uh, because it's right there. And then especially easy if the forces are constant, because then the acceleration is constant. We just finished up a little bit ago with the work energy equation. If you remember uh, its general form, where it takes into account that any work done on the system is going to change the mechanical energy of the system. And that's what these three terms here are. Uh, the kinetic the gravitational and the elastic potential energies in there. Those are all uh, mechanical energy terms as opposed to uh, thermal, nuclear, chemical type energies. So sometimes given uh, delta E. This was really good, if you remember, for position dependent problems. Because the work term have a distance in it, the distance over which a force acts. The gravitational and elastic potential energy terms both had position components to them. So very, very good for position dependent problems. Uh, those that have some distance as part of them or are asked for those distances. Now one thing I didn't point out, I don't believe, that it's very important you remember about this, especially in contrast to the two other methods that we've looked at, the F equals MA and then the impulse momentum method, is that this one is not a vector equation. The kinetic energy, when we square the velocity in there, that has no directional components. The velocity that that object is moving in any direction, whatever the direction, it's just simply one half mv squared. There's no directional component to that. And that's true of all the other terms. Well, there's a bit of a directional component in this one because you, you have been here the gravitational field direction, and that's the movement in that gravitational field not a cross moment, but still it's not a vector equation. And the, this potent, elastic potential energy didn't care which direction the springs were pulling, it just cared how much that they were stretched or squished. And nothing else in it mattered. The third one we had was the impulse momentum equation. Very good for time dependent problems. And it is a vector equation. This one does uh, have a definite dependence in it upon uh, direction in the problem. Uh, and with F equals MA and this one, what we usually do with those is we split them into their component directions and use the equation in exactly that form. Remember that this G is the linear momentum. Very, very good for time-dependent problems.
problems that have some component in it of time. Either the force varies with time, and in that case, and, uh, the integral takes just the area onto that graph. So those are the three new things we've had so far. We're going to add to this one a little bit today uh, as we look at angular momentum. It's um, a little bit non-intuitive, especially for those cases where something's not going along some circular path, but it does hold uh, and have its, its uh, usefulness in, in certain general type problems, not just those where something is, uh, is going in an angular fashion. So, set that up now. All right. Uh, for those of you that who took statics, remember from that we had our uh, uh, second of the big tools that we used. That the sum of the moments with respect to any particular point O was the position vector from point O to whatever object we're talking about cross with the net force. And that can be either done as uh, R cross F for the individual forces, or you can add up all the forces and do R cross uh, F on the residual forces. Either way, it didn't matter. In statics, this would equal zero. In dynamics, it's not necessarily going to equal zero anymore. Uh, but we did set this up to that basic piece from statics. All right, we're going to do a little bit more with it now. Let's see, R, zero, cross, M, V, dot, because the sum of the forces is MA, of course. This could also be written if we wished as R0 cross G dot, the time rate of change of the linear momentum. So this is, a, in a way, the, the rate at which the linear momentum is changing as the object goes past some other point. Uh, if it's going towards the point, then the cross product diminishes. Um, so it, uh, it is mostly taking into account how fast that object might be going past uh, past some uh, arbitrary, often arbitrary, point O. So it might look something like this. If we have some object of mass M moving along some path, then at any point there, it's got a momentum, and the sum of the moments about that point are going to be equal to R cross MA uh, as we go about that point. So that's the kind of thing we're looking at, even if uh, uh, we're not necessarily going in a circular path of any kind. So let's see. Uh, what's not clear at the moment is what that thing there is, this, uh, this new part to it we've just got. So let's see if we can illuminate on that a little bit. Let's do this first, and then we're going to see that this will come out of it. So if we take the time rate of change of R cross MV, That's going to require uh, what I, I think it's the product rule. So we'll have R dot cross MV plus R cross MV dot using the product rule. Look about right.
Now, uh, this first one here. Let's look at that. We've got R dot cross MV, but R dot is itself V, because however the position vector changes with time is the velocity. So I've got MV cross MV. Anybody want to do that cross product for me? Why is it zero? These two vectors are parallel to each other. Not the same vector, but they're parallel to each other. It's just the vector multiplied by a positive constant. Those two vectors are parallel to each other. This is then zero. And you can make up some numbers and put them in and work out the cross product and you'll see exactly that. So this first part of it is identically zero. And the second part of it is what we had right here. So that we know then that this is the sum of the moments is BDT of R cross MV, the, the part here that we started with. That part we started with, <coughs> this part right here, is defined as the angular momentum of an object with respect to some point Oh, whatever that point may be. It might be the origin, might be some other part of the problem. Our book, in its wisdom, uses a capital H for angular momentum. So the angular momentum is defined as R0 cross MV. And of course, remember that the cross product is a vec results in a vector itself. So what we've got now is the sum of the moments, whatever moments, uh, whatever torques, if you will, are applied in some problem, is equal to the time rate of change of the angular momentum. A, a, a different creature, just as moments were different than the forces, but as always, these things are very closely related. The sum of the forces was the time rate of change of the linear momentum. So these two are, are closely related. Together they are the time rate of change of the momenta. That's plural of momentum, I think. It is now. Those two things together completely define the dynamics of a particle in space. And remember, that's all we've been looking at is uh, particle dynamics for this first part of the course. We'll go to rigid body dynamics very, very shortly here. But those two together will completely define the dynamics. Whatever the force or whatever the object is doing and what the forces are that are causing it to do uh, exactly that.
All right, let's uh, let's double check as we usually do in here. The units on angular momentum. Let's see. Of course, R is in meters, masses in kilograms, and velocity is in meters per second. A kilogram meter per second is equal to a newton second, and we have a meter left over, so this is equal to a newton meter second. Let's see if that makes sense. Uh, the time rate of change of that will have seconds on the bottom canceling the seconds that is exactly what the units of moment are so the time rate of change of the momentum angular momentum will give us units that work out just right uh, just like um, the uh, linear momentum equation also did so those parts all work out uh, work out well. Let's see. H O is R cross M V, which in matrix form is R X R Y R Z and then M V X M V Y or X dot Y dot if you wish M V and then uh, you can remind yourselves a little bit on how to how to do uh, matrix a, a simple matrix like that a simple cross product um, interesting to look at for 2D problems which is where we spend the bulk of our time for 2D problems then there is no Z component for either term which automatically makes the other two components of the cross product zero and leaves you then with just the uh, K component is R X M V Y minus, remember we do the cross box with the minus in between, R Y M V X in the K direction. And we can even draw that and see it. Take a second to copy that down. Make sure I got all the little notation things right. We've got a lot of going in here. There's dots coming and going, and time rate of changes coming and going, and the like. All right, let's put that picture we just had up there again. Here's some mass going with some velocity. That gives it uh, linear momentum, mv. And it's got a position r0. A 2D problem that lies right there on the board. If we look at what those two components are, let's see, the x component times the y component of the linear momentum. So the x component, there's our x times the y component of the momentum, there's mvy. So we get rx times mvy. Let's see if we can figure out where the minus sign comes from. 
if we look at the other component, here's Ry. Ry, that's the moment arm times MVX. There's MVX there. Notice that both of those have uh, a moment in the same direction. Both of those, Rx times MVY is doing a counterclockwise moment. MVX times Ry is also doing a counterclockwise moment. But the minus sign comes because Vx is in the negative direction. It's the negative direction of Vx that gives a similar angular momentum to that piece. And using our right-hand rule, both of those then are positive in the k direction. So Vx would be negative, making this positive, the two add together. Uh, for this particular picture, for other Rs, other Vs, uh, it's still going to work out that they contribute each other in the same way. So for that particular example, it's the easiest one to see. I'll leave that up for a minute or two. All right, so one other piece then we get to that is, let's see, we've got uh, some of the moments equal D Dt of R0 cross MV. That was that whole term there on the right hand side is the H0 dot, the time rate of change of the angular momentum. But we can uh, do what we've done before, do a little bit of simple differential algebra. Move the dt over. Actually, let me uh, let me just put h zero in there. It's going to be simple. I don't need that whole thing right now. And then, of course, we can integrate that over time, and we get then that if the moment is time variant, then we've got the area under that curve, the, the moment time graph. And we can do it in this separate component direction, do it in the x direction, do it in the y direction. It's a little difficult to draw a vector time graph in two dimensions. And then, of course, this piece over here is delta H0. So it looks very, very much like our linear impulse momentum equation where the impulse caused a change in the momentum. So we have those two very same equations again uh, related. Both happening at the same time on these, in these problems. It's not that one happens or the other happens. Uh, unless the object has a velocity straight through the origin, then there would be no moment. But that would show up in the cross product being zero as well. All right, so we have the principle of angular momentum, impulse momentum, and linear impulse momentum. All right, we'll work through a couple now. Easier said than done. Um, usually, the thing's bit a bit simpler than when we start working on some things. So, let's imagine a problem. We have a circular track
one quarter of that circular track and a crate is sliding down that track. Something like uh, UPS or FedEx might have to worry about if you ever end up designing some of their equipment. So at some particular point, at some angle, theta, it's got a velocity v down the path, and we want to figure out what's the angular momentum. And we want to find at that time what its acceleration is. which would be the tangential acceleration, because the normal acceleration is just v squared over r. And if uh, we're assuming that we know some velocity at a particular angle, uh, there's nothing there to calculate that. So we're not going to bother with that one. OK, let's see what we got. h0 is r cross mv now we can do this in two ways we can do the cross product itself or we can use a little bit simpler way to do it especially for two dimensional problems as this one is if we remember what the magnitude of the cross product is and the direction we can get from simple observation. So here's our two-dimensional problem. We've got some object at some point, r, moving with some velocity that gives it a momentum, mv. The magnitude of the cross product for a two-dimensional problem like this is, So that we don't actually have to do the cross product all the time. The magnitude, <coughs> and you can write it whichever way you want. I just simply leave off the uh, vector sign to get magnitude. Is the magnitude of each of the components of it, RMV, times sine phi, where phi is the angle between the two vectors. It's that angle there. And then for that particular picture, it'd be obvious that the direction is this, in this particular instance, in the plus k direction if that's uh, x and y there, and then positive z is out. So we can save ourselves a little bit of trouble and do that. The angle of phi is the angle between these two. That's the velocity, so it's also the direction of the linear momentum mv and the angle between them is simply 90 degrees. So this is nothing more than r mv. So the angular momentum then in this case we've got the magnitude all we need to do is apply some direction to it. If we use the same coordinate system we had before, uh, this time you can see it's going into the board, so it would be a minus R and B K. 
or in other words, uh, what we typically call clockwise. So and that can just come from inspection. Um, for visualizing other cross products, remember our cross MV, we need to visualize the two vectors as being tail to tail before we do the cross product. So I can take these vectors, put them like this, then you do R cross MV, and for that picture it brings the, uh, the momentum vector out of the board. R cross MV, it's got to be into the board for that example. So uh, perhaps a, a simpler way to do some of those things. Okay, so that was, that, was, that was easy. We're happy with that, I think. I am. I hope you are too. We've got to find then um, <coughs> the tangential velocity, which we also know as V dot. That we can <coughs> find from... the uh, sum of the moments because V dot is right in there. It's just a, a, a piece of that. Which is the time rate of change of the, uh, of the linear momentum. Alright, uh, let's see. Uh, the time rate of change of the linear momentum we've got, it's, it's just that piece over there. Um, so that's not going to be any great difficulty. Because we can just take the uh, time rate of change of that part of the vector. So there's our V dot right there. Uh, what may not be as apparent is what is the sum of the moments. Don't forget that this box has some weight, mg. It also is experiencing a normal force. from the track itself. The sum of the moments is the sum the, those two moments, those two forces cause with respect to uh, our main point O. The normal force causes no moment because it goes right through O. So just to make things a little clearer, I'm going to erase that one because We've got then the two components of the weight this one was equal and opposite to the moment uh, to the normal force anyway uh, goes also through the origin we're not concerned at that point we're concerned only with this component here that is perpendicular to R It is of magnitude mg sine phi, because uh, there's phi there. So I can then say, let's see, the sum of the moments is uh, mg. Sine, oh, not sweet, I guess it's theta, sorry. And that problem I have to draw theta. That's why I should take notes in chalk. And that is also in the minus k direction. And so we can solve for v dot it equals m 
g sine theta, wherever, whatever angle it happens to be at where it has the velocity v, uh, divided by rm, the m's cancel, and we're left with g sine theta over r. No, hang on, hang on, something's missing. Uh, this is just the force, but what I don't have in there is the moment arm, so I need an R in here as well. If you notice, the units wouldn't have worked with that. So I need a minus R in here. Now the R's cancel, the M's cancel, we get just G sine theta. So the, now the units work because they both have units of acceleration. I forgot the moment arm working on this perpendicular component of the uh, of the weight. Okay. What? Okay. Okay. So the two-dimensional problems get uh, get easy, especially when we notice when we've got components that go right through O and components that are perpendicular to O. Yeah, Joe? We have to solve for you. Well, AT, remember that um, in curvilinear components, the tangential velocity, the, the object only has tangential velocity, therefore, uh, v dot entirely uh, gives us the tangential acceleration. Remember that the normal acceleration is the centripetal acceleration. That was supplied by the centripetal force uh, n. but uh, uh, we're not going to be doing three-dimensional problems. We're not going to be doing terribly complex ones, so it'll grow on you. Let's try another problem. So here's a circular track. With a car going around the track, it's a 100-meter radius corner. At this instant, we'll call it one, it's got a speed of five meters per second. And at that moment, the driver hits the gas, gives it some force that accelerates the car along the track. And the force is a function of time. 150 t squared, where t is in seconds. And so we want to find v2. Five seconds later, after this acceleration starts, where it's hit the gas, so that gets a forward force from the tires. Find V2 after five seconds. All right, we can use angular momentum as a two-dimensional problem, two dimensions as seen there, which is nice. It allows us to ignore 
a couple of the other forces in the problem. One is that there's a normal force on the car that is uh, up from the bottom of the track. It's, it's tough to draw. I guess I could try. If the uh, car is here, then it's got this uh, force there driving it forward, but it's also got a normal force up and its own weight down. It's also got a frictional force directed radially inward. That's actually what's supplying the, uh, the centripetal force. But we don't need to worry about any of those three forces um, because they have nothing to do with the uh, direction of motion. The N and the W are not, uh, a, a, they're a two dimensional problem with R, but not in the direction of motion. The friction force goes through the origin. So it contributes no moment. So we only need to consider the force F that's doing the acceleration in terms of what change in the uh, uh, motion it'll cause. All right, time to end the problem. We can use our impulse, momentum, equation. And we'll use curvilinear components. Uh, look at this only in the tangential direction. Makes it a little bit easier. We don't have to worry about x and y changing. And so the moment then becomes an integral from 0 to 5 seconds. Five, 0 seconds is when the acceleration started. The moment is the moment caused by the force doing the acceleration, which is r times f. We only need their magnitudes because they are by definition perpendicular. R cross F dt and the R cross MV is also perpendicular so we can use uh, R M uh, then it'll be not, not the right thing there. This is just delta H, not H dot, sorry. That makes more sense, because now this is bam, the delta V we're looking for. All right, so take a couple seconds, finish that up. We know what R is, it's constant. F is given as 150 t squared, um, then m, sorry, the car has a mass of 1.5 megagrams. It's a standard unit of weight for uh, dinosaurs. Is this okay? There you go, Joe. There's an interval for you. R is 100. F is given, so you can do the interval. Then you've got RM and 
the first V and find the second V. Alan, doing okay with that? Got it already? Well, I don't have any units in the calculator. Let's see. It should be, is it? The hardest place with the units is the megagrams just because it's not something we're typically used to. Two-dimensional problems with lots of 90 degrees are inherently easier. Second square, not meters. Was that your question? Yeah. Sorry about that. Golly, who would have thought traps would have caught the units? Five megagrams is one hundred uh, is fifteen hundred kilograms, and then we're looking for V two, and V one is five.
squared integrates to t cubed over 3. And then you can solve for v2. Should get something like 9.17. They're in the same plane as is the pulley. So if we happen to look at it down, down the shaft, you'll see the pulley with a force on it that's turning this. And that could be uh, you know, a simple propulsion thing of some kind. And then behind it, you see each of these each of those parts there. That seems pretty clear, doesn't it? Travis, okay? Come be with that? All right, put a couple numbers to it. Um, these arms are very slender, 400 millimeters long. The radius on that front disc is 100 millimeters. Is that right? The radius? Yeah, the radius is 100 millimeters. And each of these little pieces here are 3 kilograms. basic setup. Zero, and its final angular velocity 
needs to be 150 RPM. Find how long that force must be applied. If this was a, a little satellite, you're trying to spin up to some speed. How long would you have to spin it before you could release it? You know, maybe make some some spinning rate to uh, stabilize it before it's released. All right, do this with the angular momentum. of this is disk where the force is applied. dependent because I'm asking for time but the forces aren't time dependent
Alan, doing okay? It's got an awesome drawing to start with. That always helps, doesn't it? Yeah. Careful, there's two radii in here. Anything yet? Not yet? Okay, you might want to do these a piece at a time. For example, the impulse side, we're integrating from zero to some time later, I guess we would call that delta T, it'll come out. We want to figure out how long that is. The moment is, of course, the force times the moment arm. Those are both constant. So you just have to watch your units. Since they're constant, they come out and it integrates to delta T, and there's the delta T we'll be looking for. Equals what? Two newton meters. side, unless I made a goof, I don't think so. Never ever do. And then we're looking for, uh, we, we've got both of the momentum sides, all we have to do is figure them out. cross MV, but since they're perpendicular, they just become R M V. And since R and M are constant, then it just becomes V2 minus V1. Um, however, what's the mass? On this part, it's not one of these, it's all four of them. So it's like four out in front. And what are the velocities? These are not the velocities. These are your angular velocity, angular velocities. What we need are linear velocities in there. But maybe you remember from from uh, physics one of the equals R omega. When R and uh, V are perpendicular, as they are here. So starting from rest, getting up to a rotational speed of 150 RPM. Travis, okay? Where are you stuck? Okay. 
Travis's question was, where did the four come from? <coughs> four of the four kilogram masses. Four of these three kilogram masses. Each one of them contributes to the angular momentum. So there's only one other little trap in here. One trap left. R is no trouble. That's the 400 millimeters. Uh, this R was the 100 for the moment arm of the force. M is 3 kilograms, but there's 4 of them. That's the 4. What? To find the velocity, you need omega. It's very easy when it's zero, but you can't put 150 RPM in here and get the right number. You've got to make this into radians per second to get the velocity to work. And that's 15.7 radians per second. So now you can figure out the two velocities, then all you've got left is to equate these and solve for delta T. How do you get this? Yeah. Uh, 150 revolutions per minute times one minute is 60 seconds, so the minutes cancel, and then two pi radians for every revolution, so the revolutions cancel then, mm -hmm. and we're left with radians per second, that should be 15 seconds, was it? Is a total change in momentum. Does anybody have that number? I don't even know if I have it. Yeah, well, it starts with all we need is, is H2 because H1 is zero. Because V1 is zero. And I've got 30.1. Kilogram meters squared per second, which is a uh, uh, newton meter second. And then uh, all you have to do is solve for delta T, and you get. Fifteen point one seconds. Sounds right. Now we're starting another problem. So any questions? Phil? You did that one perfectly? About the uh, radians per second? You did? 